Over to you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks very much for that introduction. And I would reiterate your thanks as well, of course, to Amelia from the Development Office for arranging this. It's one of the one of the small silver linings of the pandemic that we can organize events like this. And I see we have a an audience covering a very, very wide range of longitude, um, including my own here back in um, in my hometown where, uh, where where I'm visiting for a for a few weeks, um, not not too far away from the from the Greenwich Meridian. Um, I had hoped that perhaps the spectacular background of the Mourne Mountains might be might be available while <laughs> while I was speaking. But um, we had we had a beautiful sunny day yesterday. But today, normal service has been resumed for <laughs> for Ireland, and the uh, the cloud and the cloud and the rain has has come in again. Now, what I shall do is I shall try to set up my PowerPoint presentation which I hope shall appear. Very good. Now, given a, an expected diversity of audience, what I'm going to talk about today will include a range of technical details. I'll have a few tidbits of interesting uh, bits of physics for those who may have studied it in the past and may remember some, but plenty of illustrative and qualitative and very, very beautiful in many cases uh, descriptions of some of the things we're doing. And for all the range of longitude of people around the planet that we have listening today, we're going to travel a long distance away to the origin of some of these particles that we study. And then watch, happens, watch what happens when they hit the, the Earth's atmosphere and we start to do astronomy and astrophysics and particle physics with them. Now, I shall start, um, uh, let me just check if, 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 my, if uh, my slides are showing well. And can I just check as well, is my cursor visible if I move that around the screen? Or is my screen without a cursor? That's something I don't know about the, the technology. I'm waving a little arrow and I think that's not visible. Fine, OK, so I should be aware of that. Um, the thing I want to begin with is to give an indication of the vast range of electromagnetic signals that come from deep space that we observe and do physics with um, in, in all sorts of realms of astronomy. Um, when, we, when we see the world with the human eye, uh, we, we see visible light, and one can very, very easily make an analogy with the color of light that's visible to the human eye and the pitch of a note on a, on a piano keyboard. Um, we have a, a we have a range of wavelengths, that is in, 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 in this analogy, the pitch, and it spans about a factor of two for the human eye. So that's about the same as one octave on a piano keyboard. And the thing I'd like to introduce to start this is to show that if we wanted to cover all the range of energy that can be detected with current technology that we use in astronomy, going from the radio wave band at the very, very lowest energies of the radiation through the higher energies of microwaves, infrared, and then the visible wavelengths that we can see with the human eye are shown by a small band in the middle of my piano keyboard here. And then at higher energies, we have ultraviolet and X-ray and then gamma rays at the very highest energies. If one represented that factor of two in pitch or in wavelength that the human eye is sensitive to, then to show the entire wavelength range that we can detect with modern astronomical techniques, it would require a keyboard that's 10 times wider than an 88 key grand piano. There is a huge, huge range of energy that's invisible to the human eye, but that is possible to detect with modern astronomical technology. And I want to begin our journey today at the radio end of the spectrum and look at the sky in what we in looking at the sky as we would see it if our eyes were able to see at radio wavelengths. This is a beautiful little picture that's a um, a simulation, a mock-up based on data that's taken with telescopes that measure the sky at radio wavelengths by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in the United States. And what we see here superficially looks as if it's the night sky, similar to it might be as it might be seen to the human eye at a nice dark um, site away from civilization and all its uh, and all its bright lights somewhere on the surface of the earth. Now the fascinating distinction here 
is that when we look at the night sky with the naked eye, almost almost everything that we can see is a star inside the Milky Way, our own home galaxy. And in terms of the scale of the universe, these are all very, very nearby. So the metaphor would be that they are in our, in our backyard. Um, when we look at the universe with radio telescopes, technology that came on the scene um, after, the, uh, after the end of World War II, when people who had worked on radar typically in World War II turned their technological expertise to more um, pure scientific uh, uh, avenues, it became obvious that there were a large number of objects up there in the, in the universe which emit a lot of radio energy. And in contrast with the stars that are always very, very close to us when we see them with the naked eye, the brightest objects in the sky when we look at radio wavelengths are at vast distances away from us. Many of the objects in the picture that we see here, this representation is showing the brightness against the blank dark sky in the background, represents the intensity, the loudness of the radio hiss, if you like, coming from these objects. And some of these are one half or three quarters of the way out to the edge of the observable universe. So they must be vastly more luminous, vastly more powerful than the stars that we see with the naked eye because they, 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 they dominate the, the sky as it's observed at, at radio wavelengths. Now, when we zoom in on these with finer detail, with more um, precise radio wavelength observations, again, what we're seeing here is a representation of the intensity of the radio emission that's coming out from different positions on the sky. And this strange looking object is quite typical of what these radio sources look like when we examine them in detail. What's going on here is the little dot in the center of the screen is a very massive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Now that black hole, as people will know from popular science and um, colloquial descriptions of these things, a black hole is an object which gobbles stuff up um, with an appetite that is uh, sufficiently voracious that it, uh, it rarely stops. And that's something we'll come to a little bit later because there's some fa fascinating things about the growth of galaxies that are involved here. But what we believe is happening with many of, the, of these black holes is that not everything falls into the black hole. Some small fraction of the material um, which is spiraling into the black hole is actually squirted away from the north and south poles, if you like, of a spinning black hole in very, very energetic and very powerful jets of plasma that emits radio radiation. And these spread out into deep intergalactic space. In this image, the, at radio wavelengths, the stars in the galaxy that surround the black hole would only be a small fraction of the center of the image and spreading out here to hundreds of thousands of light years away from the center the radio plasma jets spread out into space and these beautiful clouds and plumes of emission, these are some of the, uh, some of the most beautiful objects in, in astronomy, are the plasma spreading out into intergalactic space to huge distances away from the black hole at the, at the center. And there are fascinating aspects of physics, theoretical gravitational physics and plasma physics involved in these. One of the things I like to um, one of the things I like to, to, to say to describe these is to take the, um, to take the old line about holding, holding the universe in one's hand. If one imagines the size of the black hole in these objects, which in reality is maybe something like about the size of our solar system, um, billions of kilometers across, it would be the same size as the distance from the sun to the planet Jupiter. If one scaled that down so that the black hole were the size of an atom, one could hold an object like this in one's hand. And that's an amazing dynamic range in the physical scale of these objects. No conceivable human nanotechnology can create an object where a little machine on the scale of an atom can create a jet of material that will have a scale of tens of centimeters. Huge dynamic range there. And that's one of the fascinating bits of theoretical gravitational plasma physics that's involved in these objects. And here's a little cartoon of what's going on down at the center. Often what we see is there's a black hole that we cannot image directly, of course, because black holes, apart from the tiny caveat that people may have heard of, of course, of what's called Hawking radiation, the very subtle quantum effect, 
The black hole itself does not emit any radiation, but it's gobbling up material, which is shown in this cartoon as the donut shaped object around the black hole. This is gas and dust from between the stars in the galaxy. Most of that gets gobbled up and ends up in the black hole and the black hole grows in size over the course of time. But a small fraction of it seems to be ejected from, as I've described earlier, the north and south pole, so to speak, of the black hole here by processes which are, of which we only have a very sketchy knowledge at the present time. But we believe that the magnetic field, something like a hugely more powerful and hugely scaled up process of the north and south aurora on the Earth, the northern lights and the southern lights, um, but scaled up on such, a, on such a scale that they can stretch out for hundreds of thousands of light years. That's the origin of these very, very relativistic jets. Now, I'll do a very, very brief, this will only take two slides, but this is a taster for the people who may remember some of the physics details here. One of the wonderful things about these jets is that if they're coming very, very close to the line of sight, and they're traveling very, very close to the speed of light, the material in the jet is almost catching up with the light that it emits. And there's a calculation that can be done which shows that when you look at an object where the jet is actually pointing very, very closely towards you, but because it's out in deep space, you can only see the sideways component of its motion. So it's coming almost along the line of sight and we only see the part of the motion that's sideways, that can seem to be faster than the speed of light. It's an optical illusion, but it's a fascinating one, which when it was confirmed in the 1970s, won an awful lot of praise for the observational and theoretical aspects that were, that were involved. Here's a, little, um, here's a little demonstration. This is an image that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, a series of images taken with the Hubble Space Telescope over several years. Um, between 1994 and 1998. And what we see here is the little red blobs in those bottom five panels are slightly brighter parts of the plasma in the jet moving away from the black hole, which is off to the left. And if we look at the scale bar, we see that that right hand most blob has moved a distance apparently of 24 light years across the plane of the sky but in a time that we see on Earth of only four years. And what's happening here is this very, very fascinating optical illusion that the jet of Kira is not actually moving sideways in the plane of the sky. It's coming almost towards us. And because the light from the jet is traveling only very, very slightly faster than the jet itself, the jet is almost catching up. And that gives the impression that the material is moving sideways faster than the than the speed of light. So that's my first little teaser about things breaking the traditional Einsteinian idea that things cannot travel faster than the speed of light. These observations with radio telescopes are made with arrays of telescopes separated by very, very large distances. And there's some fascinating electronic technology here that was originally developed in the 1970s, where each individual telescope is pointed at the target and the observations are recorded onto a video cassette recorder. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> I've lost my share screen, I think. Is my presentation still showing? No. No, it's your, we can see you. Let me try again. Yes, here we are again. Thank you. Right. OK, yes. Um, some some fascinating technology here. The individual telescopes are recorded onto um, high density videotape at a very, very slow track speed of the tape. And then the tapes are brought back together to a central facility where they are recorded against an atomic clock and the tiny variations in the signal from each telescope allow us to reconstruct the radio intensity on the sky at very, very, very high precision in terms of the sharpness of the image.
at the moment. This is the base of one of these radio jets shown in a little animation. This is an animation based on data that's taken over the course of a couple of years. And in this image, the black hole itself is invisible, but it's a little bit to the left of the blue blob. And the jet of material is being collimated and accelerated to speeds very close to the speed of light within a tiny fraction of a percent of the speed of light. It's probably a couple of hundred radii of the black hole itself. And this is one of the big questions we have in high energy astrophysics at present is how does that process occur? We have a general outline idea that the black hole is spinning and then the black hole has some magnetic field in the sense that the Earth has its own um, magnetic dipole field that gives us the North Pole and South Pole aurorae. But these, because the black hole is spinning um, with relativistic effects coming into play, the intensity of the magnetic field is such that it's able to accelerate charged particles to extraordinary energies. And the flickering here is showing over the course of a few months, the slight changes in the flow of the jet. So if you imagine this as the jet of a, um, of a hose from a fire engine, there's very small fractional changes in the intensity of the material coming from the jet. But this is all coming with huge powers, which I shall discuss in a moment. So just to give something then in the terms of a slightly more um, slightly more laid back and indeed um, a slightly humorous in a couple of slides discussion of this. Um, technically, when we talk in physics about power, what we're talking about is the speed at which energy is supplied from one part of a system to another, from one object to another, or in our case here, from the region around the black hole being placed out into empty space. And the numbers associated with this become astronomical uh, very quickly. But to give some uh, idea of just what the scale of these large numbers can be, if we take a typical kettle, um, boiling water in a litre of water in a kettle for a cup of tea, the power required to do that is about 2000 watts in the, in the technical unit of, um, of power delivery that we use in physics. Um, now, here is something that is significantly more powerful. Um, if you take the jet engine from a military jet fighter plane, the power output of that coming out the back in terms of the hot plasma that's exhausted from the back of the jet, and that gives the thrust to the plane, that's about 100,000 watts. Um, sorry, 100 million watts. Uh, now, in contrast to a domestic electric kettle, which can boil a litre of water in about a minute or two, a military jet engine could boil a bathtub full of water in about a second. So that's the scale of the most powerful machines that we have in, um, in present technology on Earth. And indeed, 100,000 watts concentrated into a jet is something like 10% of the power output of a big nuclear power station. Um, of course, you know, um, a, a, a plane like this with the, with the jets turned up to full power runs out of fuel very, very quickly indeed. Um, but that's the power level that we can create in a collimator jet with present technology. Now, the numbers that are associated with these astronomical objects range up to 10 to the 30 and plus. So one here with something like around about 30 zeros after it. That's the power in this object we're showing on the screen, which is another Hubble Space Telescope image. Beautiful color rendition. This is the visible wavelength. Um, so as would be um, as would be seen by the human eyes if our eyes were sensitive enough um, of a nearby galaxy whose um, whose phone number is uh, is M87. Um, and this number about 10 to the, getting on for 10 to the 30, the, 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 the sense of scale here can be illustrated if I um, show you this. We talked about boiling a kettle, litre of water in a couple of minutes, a very powerful jet engine, a bathtub of water in a second. If you took the power coming out of the jet of one of these objects, you could vaporise all the water on the planet in a millionth of a second. Um, so this is getting into the realms of evil genius planet destroying uh, technology here. Very, very powerful things. And these objects are entirely naturally created. It's very, very hard not to be a little bit anthropomorphic, so to speak, and talk about them as machines. But they're entirely natural. It's one of the fascinating 
parts of the physics and you know where the, where the, where, the, where the beauty of the physics comes in here the, the amazing things that that um, that nature herself can can create and let me give you a little description here with a cartoon of some of the fascinating things that these jets can do and how important they are aside from all the deep theoretical physics how they're related to the way that galaxies grow and then ultimately how people like ourselves find ourselves living on planets in in galaxies so i'm going to show what starts out here as a little simulation of the region near the black hole the disk of material spiraling into the black hole and then a small fraction of that is ejected from the center as we zoom out into the galaxy here we see the stars of the galaxy similar to the neighborhood perhaps of our own sun in the milky way and as these jets expand and separate away from the center of an individual galaxy what is increasingly obvious to us in our observations is that from time to time they will intersect with material in the outer parts of the galaxy in this case we've got a demonstration of a small part of the galaxy where there's a slightly denser clump of stars and gas and we think a fascinating process happens here whereby if too much gas and dust and uh, material close to the center of the galaxy generates a very powerful jet that in turn blasts away material in the outer part of the galaxy which then stops more material accreting down onto the center so it's fascinating that nature without um without any direct intervention mechanically other than the way the particles themselves behave creates a natural thermostat effect here that sets a scale onto which galaxies can grow and that's very important for um planet formation because it means that the space in between the stars is at a particular temperature and a particular density which allows planets to form and in turn allows life to develop certainly as we know on earth and of course as many uh, as, as as many astronomers and planetary scientists would expect out there in other parts of the universe it's highly highly likely if not certain that life has, has developed elsewhere so these objects although they seem arcane and very theoretically abstract seem to play a very very fundamental role in the processes which actually control the way that life develops in the universe um now the next thing i will do is i'll just talk a very little bit about how in terms of the physics how we get from the radio end of the spectrum to the gamma rays that we are spending in in, in our group in oxford we spend a lot of time um discussing now the radio end of the spectrum if you remember from our analogy right at the start of the talk is at the lowest pitch the most bass notes on the on the piano or the 10 pianos side by side and the gamma rays are up at the at the far end with pitches that are millions and millions of times higher that is to say the energy of the little light corpuscles the photons is millions upon millions of times higher than radio and the way that these are created in the jets is surprisingly simple but when one thinks about the energies that are involved it's astonishingly efficient and astonishingly powerful a background light or radio wave photon just happily traveling minding its own business going through interstellar space if it happens to be hit by one of the very fast particles moving in the jet then that photon can be given enough energy to become a gamma ray um this is a um this is a significant promotion um this is a uh, yes this 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 is this is something far 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 beyond the scale of of what would be what would be achieved by writing enough nature papers in a um, in a university for example um and although i'm not a um, i'm not a follower of football myself but my students assure me that the the legs that we see on the right hand of this image belong to somebody who is a a very very talented football player who at the moment i understand is trying to get out of barcelona and the energy ratios here this is what's going on it would be the same as if a soccer ball were hit by a bullet train traveling at full speed so 750 tons going over 300 kilometers per hour that's the ratio of the energies and what happens in these collisions is that the visible wavelength photon or radio wavelength photon in 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 some cases is hit by the fast particle in the jet and then that creates a hugely energetic 
gamma ray. It's still light in the sense it's still a photon, but the energy now is millions and millions of times higher. And in recent years, there has been a great improvement in detecting gamma rays coming from objects in space. Um, I'm going to start this section by discussing one of the great achievements of extremely high technology space science here, um, which is the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So Fermi named after the great Italian physicist of the mid 20th century. Um, and essentially the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope is a particle physics detector, like many of the detectors you might see in popular science discussions of the Large Hadron Collider um, at CERN outside Geneva. And this, by very, very skillful uh, persuasion of the lead scientist on this project, um, was put on a satellite and launched by NASA. Um, the, the machine itself is very, very heavy. Um, of course, in satellite missions, weight is often the single prime engineering constraint. And the way that this telescope works is it's got layers of tungsten, one of the densest materials, um, and the high energy gamma ray comes in from space, hits the top layer of tungsten, and it knocks an electron and a positron out of the tungsten. And then there are layers of detectors, like the detector in your uh, smartphone um, or a digital camera, and then further layers of tungsten behind. And then this gives a track through the telescope that can tell you what the direction of the incoming gamma ray was and what the energy of the incoming gamma ray was. So fabulous technology here. And this has revolutionized our view of the universe at these very, very high energies of gamma rays. This is a view of the whole sky. And the orientation of this picture is such that the plane of the Milky Way is across the center. So this is if we were if we were in orbit around the Earth and oriented our heads so that the band of the Milky Way was across the center of the image. And there's plenty of a, uh, there's plenty of uh, gamma ray emission coming from the Milky Way itself. And it's only bright in this image um, because it's right in front of our faces. But those of us of a certain age might remember the comedy TV show in the 90s, Father Ted, where there was a description of some things being small and some things being far away. In this case, the plane of the galaxy is right in front of us and is bright. But interestingly, if we go back right to the start of the talk where I showed the image of the sky at radio wavelengths, if we move away from the plane of the Milky Way, above and below, those little individual dots, those are the same objects that we see at radio wavelengths. So they're emitting radiation with very, very high power. They're extremely luminous both at the radio end of the spectrum, where the individual light particles have very, very low energies, and also at the very, very high energy gamma ray end of the spectrum, where the photons have got extremely high energies. Now, this technology definitely revolutionized our view of the sky at the highest energies, but it's extremely expensive, and the Fermi satellite itself is an instrument which has got quite a small collecting area. Essentially, it doesn't focus. You just have to be lucky enough to catch the particles that hit the detector. So what we have done in the course of the past um, several decades since this technology started is to exploit an amazing thing in, uh, in the physics of particles traveling through materials like air or water, which is called the Cherenko effect. And this is the core of my talk and the, and the main point about particles traveling faster than the speed of light. Of course, that's, that's rhetorical. I'm not going to prove that Einstein was wrong. But what I'm going to talk about here is particles that are moving faster than the speed of light in a particular material. So what's going on here is it's a bit like the sonic boom coming from a jet plane. Now, I'll talk a little bit of detail in physics for a couple of slides here for those um, who are minded to, to pick up on the details. But it's interesting enough, it's a nice little effect, so please just watch the cartoon, because the cartoon is actually quite simple. This first one, I'm showing a blue particle in the centre. So the blue particle in the centre with the arrow coming down, that's a little charged particle, an electron, a proton, something like that, with some electrical charge around it. And it's moving quite slowly from the top to the bottom through some material, let's say for the moment that it's water. 
And as it moves down from the top to the bottom, the water molecules near the particle get stretched in terms of their own internal electric charge. They become a little bit positive at one end and they become a little bit negative at the other end. Now, if the particle's moving quite slowly, this distribution of polarization, as we call it, these stretched molecules, they're pretty much circularly symmetric around the particle that's moving slowly through the material. And the net result of that is that every time there is a positive negative on one side of the object, for example, look at the one that's about two o'clock on the clock, it's got something at the opposite side at about eight o'clock, and they cancel each other out. And that means that as the particle moves slowly through the water, you don't see anything happening. However, the spectacular effect when a charged particle moves very rapidly through a material is that the stretching, the positive and negative particles lie behind. It takes them a certain amount of time to relax back to their original shape, to their original um, situation where the positive and negative were uniformly uh, on top of each other. And that means in this case, the positives and the negatives have a net overall negative to the top of the image and positive to the bottom. And as that relaxes back to being in its original neutral configuration, some light is emitted. And this is what you see when you look at all these famous pictures of nuclear reactors or the cooling tanks where spent nuclear fuel is kept. The blue light that's very well known in, um, in images of these, that blue light is not coming from the particles themselves that are emitted from the radioactive material in the reactor. It's coming from the water. And what's happening in this case is that the charged particles move through the water and they move through the water at a speed that is faster than the speed of light in water. And that causes the water to emit something that's analogous to a sonic boom. This blue light is something like the sonic boom that's following the fast particles that are being emitted by the radioactive material in the reactor. This is what's called Cherenkov radiation after the Russian physicist who first described it back nearly a century ago. Now, what we do in our astronomical techniques is we take the Earth's atmosphere and we use that as a way of detecting the gamma rays. So what you see in this image is at the top right, the little red and yellow object is a supernova at large distance out in space that is emitting gamma rays. They travel in a straight line through the Milky Way until they hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And when they hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere in a way that's analogous to the way that the satellite detector had little particles created inside it, but much, much more spectacular, they create a cascade of charged particles that travels down through the Earth's atmosphere and takes up a distance of maybe about 10 kilometers or so, happens very quickly, and they're traveling faster than the speed of light in air. And so they cause the air to emit, analogous to a sonic boom, blue light from the charged particles traveling faster than the speed of light in air. And the initial detection of this is a great contrast. And it's one of the things that I really love about this particular aspect, this particular field of science, is that you get to work with some of the most sophisticated and high precision space science technology, and also some of the very simplest and most ingenious little things that can be done. The first ever detection of this effect from objects coming from space, from particles coming from space done on the ground, was actually done just a few miles south of Oxford in 1951 and by Jelly and Galbraith, using this very Heath Robinson little instrument. And um, the thing that looks like a bin is a bin. This telescope is made of a bin with a small World War II era surplus searchlight mirror inside it as the telescope mirror and a little photo detector with some, for the time, very high speed electronics behind it. And this allowed the first detection of these very brief flashes of light coming from the um, coming from the upper atmosphere where particles were entering and causing these Cherenkov air showers. So the next thing I shall show is a little animation of 
a simulation of one of these happening in um, in the atmosphere. Here's an image of one of the present generation of experiments. This is the Veritas experiment in Arizona. And as we zoom out, those are the telescopes on the ground. And the vertical scale here is to scale. It's about three or 400 yards across, 300 meters across at the bottom. And we zoom out now, looking up into the atmosphere. And as we go higher and higher, up to about 30 kilometers, we'll just see now the red light are the particles in the cascade that was created by the initial gamma ray, and the blue region is the light that's emitted as the particles come down. So the length of that is 10 or 15 kilometers typically, but if you look at the blue dots, those represent the visible wavelength light because they're coming very, very slightly slower than the particles in this case. They're quite compressed. And then the telescope at the bottom detects these. And the events from top to bottom, the red particles, that takes about a millionth of a second because the light emitted in the sonic boom is compressed. That takes maybe only about a billionth of a second. So we need very, very high speed electronics in our telescopes to detect these events. And this is where we get to the um, point where I can now show a little spectacular publicity video, if you like, of our current generation instruments down in the Comas Highlands region of Namibia. This is the largest gamma ray observatory at present. And this is the one which the Oxford group is involved in. We have four telescopes which have got um, uh, medium sized diameters spaced out at the four corners of a square and then a large telescope in the center of 28 meters diameter. And Namibia is one of the darkest places in the world in terms of visible wavelength astronomy. And um, to, the, to the human eye, the night sky is absolutely spectacular. And one of, the, um, one, of the, one of the associated things here is that the center of the Milky Way goes directly overhead in the austral winter in July and um, July and August. So we're able to get very, very good coverage of the center of the Milky Way and the region around the black hole that is there. And um, this is the largest instrument um, in the world at present. This is the this is the um, the the peak of the present generation of technology. Very, very large mirrors here. In fact, the 28 meter telescope is the largest optical telescope in the world at present. Um, and this is a um, uh, th this is a great this is a great instrument for um, for purely uh, abstract scientific reasons, of course. But also, we're involved in many other um, uh, aspects of capacity development in the region. Uh, not only is this great for students in the local universities, um, this offers opportunities for local engineers to get into high-speed digital technology. And actually, something that's interesting here in terms of our current situation with the pandemic. Over the past few years, the University of Namibia Astronomy Group has grown. Oh, have I lost my shared screen again, I think. Let's get that back. There we go. And, um, and that has meant that the Hess Observatory in Namibia is one of the very, very few large international astronomy observatories that was actually operating during the pandemic. Because although a lot of the time the instrument is operated by astronomers traveling um, from Europe mostly to Namibia to, to undertake the nighttime operations, the local team from the University of Namibia has grown sufficiently in recent years that now the system can operate with uh, with the local team running it. And that meant that we were able to um, go through the deepest parts of the lockdown, one of the very few international um, observatories that was able to able to do this. Um, and this is something where uh, where Exeter has, has contributed a little bit in terms of the uh, summer schools and graduate student training 
in the um, in the region, both Namibia and South Africa, where the radio telescope square kilometre array will be built in the coming years as well. Um, some of these regions, because of their remoteness, because of the low population, gives you visible light background at absolute minimum and also radio wavelength background. Nowadays, of course, mobile phones give you huge amounts of radio pollution uh, to the eyes of an astronomer, hugely important for uh, all sorts of, 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 of aspects of society. Um, but finding remote regions where there's very little radio background is very, very important for doing uh, cutting edge astronomy. Um, now, the way we, we the way we intend to move forward is to build instruments in our next generation, which will be the Cherenkov Telescope Array that, that Rick mentioned in the introduction, um, where what we hope to do is to get beyond the fact that the sharpness of our images will always be limited by the fact that we're essentially stuck on Earth. The sharpness of any image is given by a combination of the wavelength that we observe and the diameter of the telescope. So, to a, um, to a good approximation, the sharpness of any astronomical image that can be made from Earth is the diameter of the Earth. And the famous images that appeared last year from the Event Horizon Telescope team, their telescopes were separated by very, very close to the entire diameter of the Earth. So what we hope to do with the next generation of gamma ray telescopes is to use the photon energy as a proxy for angular resolution, because we have a good theoretical basis, not a total understanding, but it's a basis at the moment, to believe that the highest energy gamma rays are coming from regions very, very close to the black hole. So although we can't get an image of the region close to the black hole at very high angular resolution, with very good sharpness in the image, so to speak, we do believe that we'll be able to detect the properties of the gamma rays and then relate those to models for what's going on in the region around the black hole and try to pin down precisely what's collimating and accelerating these jets to extremely high energies. And this is a, um, this is a computer generated simulation of what we expect the Cherenkov telescope array to look like in the Atacama Desert near, um, near uh, Mount Paranal in northern Chile. And that will be under construction in the next few years um, if budgets and engineering timescales uh, stay, and they're always subject to slippage, I'm sure as anybody involved in projects like these will know, we hope this will be uh, up and running in the next three to five years. Um, so here's a view of one of the prototype cameras that we, we've been built. Various parts of this were built in the, um, in the lab in the physics department in Oxford. And that's the prototype camera sitting on one of the prototype telescope structures at the Observatoire de Paris um, at Meudon um, a couple of years ago when it was first commissioned and um, with various members of, uh, of my team and also with Tony Bell from the Atomic and Laser Physics Department in Oxford, who's an expert on various of these mechanisms of accelerating, of making high energy photons by hitting them with very high energy particles. Um, and this, uh, it, um, this image, I think perhaps my animation here is not yeah, my animation here is not showing um, on Teams, unfortunately. Slight technical hitch here. So um, I have some data which uh, shows these air showers as they appear. And they appear as a little plume of light in the field of view of the telescope. Um, and uh, they are um, lasting for a few billionths of a second. And the point I wanted to make here is that it's not only do the electronics here need to be extraordinarily fast, they also need to be extraordinarily patient because we need to read out the camera when one of these events is occurring, but then there's a lot of dead time in between the events. So if we imagine the scale being um, slowed down by about a billion times so that one of the events lasts a few seconds, like in the animation I showed you slightly earlier, during the course of one night observing, well, maybe there's eight hours of darkness, that will correspond to a few hundred thousand years. So one event will occur, it will last a few seconds, and you might have to wait a few centuries before the next one. So not only are our electronics very fast, they also have to be very patient. They can't read out continuously. We will be totally overwhelmed by the data stream. So we have to have very clever detectors, which have a buffer that senses when an event is developing 
and decides to read out the camera. And that particular technique has got excellent applications in the field of PET scan imaging. Uh, PET scan, the acronym stands for Positron Emission Tomography. If, um, if some people may be familiar with the way this works, the patient receives a dose of very, very low intensity radioactive material, which emits positrons, positive electrons. And when a positive electron from the very, very low intensity tracer in the patient interacts with the tissue in the patient, then it emits two gamma rays. And those gamma rays come out back to back, as you see the green pair of arrows and the red pair of arrows on the right hand side of the screen. And exactly the same sort of electronics that we've developed for our telescopes is particularly suited to detecting when the two pairs of the two parts of the pair of gamma rays arrive back to back in the ring of detectors. You'll see in the left hand image here, computer simulation of one of the latest generation of PET scan machines where the patient will be um, inside the tube and there's a tube of gamma ray detectors around the outside and um, very similar to our telescope technology here. So there's as you know, any, anybody who does this physics and astronomy, um, they're driven by the beauty of it. But there's a huge utilitarian aspect to this technology that, that arises immediately. Um, and then I'll just end to say there is a small prospect that we may be able to prove Einstein wrong after all. And one of the hopes that we might be able to achieve with the new generation of instruments, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, is that if we can reach energies in gamma rays that are sufficiently high enough, we may be able to detect a proposed theoretical effect, which is that the speed of light is not actually constant in a vacuum, as originally suggested by Einstein, and as all experiments to date have, um, have shown. It may be the case, and theoretical hopes for combining quantum mechanics and general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, suggests that it might be the case that quantum objects at very high energy, so the very highest energy gamma rays, have some sense that they can detect the quantized structure of space-time, a little bit like a oil tanker going through a choppy sea compared with a dinghy going through a choppy sea. They'll notice the waves more than the, than the large object. And it might be the case that a very high energy gamma ray travels at a slightly different speed to a very low energy gamma ray. Um, and this is one of the things which I cannot promise that this will happen. It's speculative. Um, but if this effect does exist, we will be able to detect it with the new generation of instrumentation and genuinely show that some light particles will travel fa faster or slower than the speed of light, because it may be the case when we look at it in fine detail that Einstein's idea about the speed of light being constant um, does actually break down um, at the very, very highest energies indeed. So I shall wrap up the I shall wrap up the slides there and hand back to hand back to Rick. Thank you very much.